now I'm recording. Now it's official. So welcome. Hello. Thanks for being here. Happy Thursday. We have data in front of us we were talking about last time. What's our latent trait in this example? Do you remember the story? Situational forgiveness. Situational forgiveness. That's what, what the trait is here. Measured by these six items. So the idea here is that one's tendency to be forgiving to whatever extent is the trait that is causing them to answer the questions in the way that they are. So we are trying to indirectly measure this trait of forgiveness by directly measuring the things that it causes. That's the, the underlying logic here. And we don't actually have the traits and we don't need them. The whole point of this is to see whether the pattern of association that underlies these six items is consistent with the factor model that we put on it. Whether the factor model adequately recreates the associations. That's what we're doing. But, as we looked at last time, I'm anticipating that a unidimensional model is not going to fit. Because I've got little pockets of correlation. Items that are worded in the same way are more related to each other than items that are worded in different ways. So this right here, covariance matrix, this is my answer key. This is what the model is trying to recreate. So this is how we judge how useful the model is, is how well its predictions match this. So means, variances, and covariances as the story. All right. We talk, started talking about M plus. Any of this that you want to go back over or ask questions about in terms of telling it about your data, the names, syntax structure, any of that stuff? Forgiveness of situations. Yes, thank you, Zoomers. No? Okay. Should we start here again? This work? Review? Maybe? Maybe? Okay. Did you say that you get credit for the beginning correlation and covariance matrix using Excel? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, this came from, this is from, I pasted it in from Excel, but this just came from, um, like just asking for like a correlation matrix in the usual way. We will get, this is from, this is directly from the data. We, as part of the model, we will get the model estimated equivalent of this. And the only distinction would be if you have missing data. Otherwise they would match perfectly. Um, I guess there's another distinction. This is the uh, REML version of the estimates. And, and in our uh, package, we'll have the ML version. So the difference is that the variances will be a little bit bigger if you estimate them directly from the data, because that's that's taking into account denominator degrees of freedom, whereas ML does not. So, but yes, this is descriptive statistics that are useful for us in terms of just looking at the patterns, and then this will be the model estimated version of this will be what the what it's trying to be re recreated. Okay. Um, other questions? Did I see a hand? No, I think I saw a thumb. Thumbs are good. Okay. So after model here, so the rest of this example is going to change out what happens after model. So don't forget that as your keyword. Everything else, though, is going to stay the same across all the models that we look at. So the first example is using a standardized factor for identification. So fixing the factor mean to what? If I'm trying to identify my factor to be standardized, zero, yeah, mean zero, and then variance is fixed to what? Another finger question, one. Can you reverse those? Could you fix the mean to one and the variance to zero? You cannot, it will break. So that's an easy thing to screw up because the factor name all by itself is referring to its variance, the factor name inside a bracket is referring to its mean or its intercept. So those two spots are easy to get transposed when you're first starting to look at this. Um, what do the stars mean in M plus? The asterisks. You want those to be estimated. Yeah, free is this the terminology or able to be estimated. Do I need all these stars? Do I need any of them? The one you need for the first value there, because otherwise it's fixing to one. 
Yes. So by default, it's fixed to one, the first one, for each factor. So I need to override that default to make it free so that I can then fix the factor variance to one instead. And what, were, what would happen if I forgot? So if I forgot my star there, what would my model be trying to do then with respect to the first item? Yes, but well, also? Um, well, it would be one and also the other thing that you fixed at one would be one. Because then it would just break, right? Uh, no, like it'll run. Everything else would be something else. Would it be intensive? It will, it will run. Say the last part of it again. So it would run, but then we are placing constraints that we didn't intend to, so everything else would then adjust. Yes, so you are, you would been the, the let me make this more concrete. If this is one here, and this is one here, that's a double constraint. So not only are you saying that I want the factor variance to be one and the first loading to be one, you're saying essentially the first item is perfect. All of it is due to factor. None of it is due to error. So that's a very strong statement, unlikely to be supported. So your model may fit badly if you do this because you're enforcing an extra constraint. So it's one or the other in this. Um, likewise, because I have the factor mean fixed to zero, I'm able to estimate all the intercepts. I don't actually have to type the stars. That's a default. And I have all six item error variances being estimated. I don't have to type that. That's a default as well. But I'm writing everything out so that it's crystal clear what all is being estimated and what is being fixed in this model. All right. So this is the short version down here. So then we looked at output. Would it be helpful to come back over this a little bit? Maybe. Uh, I picked on item one last time. How about item six? Who's feeling brave enough to put that factor loading into a sentence for me? Oh, you smiled. You're feeling brave. <laughs> you no, know, it's like, no, I'm not feeling brave. I take it back. I I'm just it. happy. I love it. <laughs> yes, who's feeling brave? You feeling brave? Um, so is it as item six it's wrong or factor? Other way around. Try it again. Yes, as the factor gets stronger, and I could say as the factor gets stronger, item six is predicted to have a higher response, or I could say for every unit higher in the factor, the expected item response for number six goes up by 0.8. So it's per unit, because this is a slope. The factor is the predictor. So this is a different way of looking at output than what you're probably used to. I think that's why folks are, are getting this backwards, because normally when you look at output, it's six predictors to, for one outcome. This is backwards. This is a multivariate model with six outcomes and one predictor. So these are six regression models essentially happening simultaneously that these are the loadings for. And which item looks to be relatively best? Got to vote for three. Yeah, can I be certain of that from these numbers, though? No. No, they're not on the same scale in the terms of what a unit is, because even though the scale has one to seven in common as the response format, these items have different variances. So we will need to look at a different part of the output to make relative comparisons across items. Uh, do you remember what 999 means? Is that a number? No. It's not a number. Ignore it. Uh, intercepts, in this case, let's see, let's stick with item six. Who is feeling brave? Who wants to put 5.321 in a sentence? Zach's feeling brave. Go for it. When the factor score 
is zero. Um, that the response on that item is 5.2, I mean 5.321. Yes, the expected response given a factor score of zero, 5.321, bingo. And that is why we typically identify the scale of the factor as having a mean of zero, because then these be directly become the means of the items. So they are not item means, though. They are intercepts. Uh, residual variances? 1.671 is what? Erica's feeling brave. I nominate you. Um, things that are not the factor? Uh, no, it's something that's not the factor. The like, unique things that are uh, the factor. Like the error, but you don't really know if it's error, so like the variance. Yes, this is leftover variability in the item that is due to not the factor. And we don't really know if it's completely error or if there's something systematic in there. We would have to have whatever systematic be measured by multiple things. So leftover is a good way to put it. So then we looked at predictions. So I wrote out predictions for item 1, which is sit 1R up here, using the parameters. So its intercept is 4.5, its factor loading is 1.2. I don't fill in the error variance for it, though, because this is a single value of E, not the variability. So there's a little bit of an asymmetry there. The model parameter is the variance of the E's, not E. It doesn't go there. Relative to the data, the original item variance and mean is going to be perfectly recreated because each item has its own intercept and residual variance, error variance, excuse me. Uh, but the covariances, we have room to be wrong. So across six items, how many covariances are there? I know there's a formula, but we can do it by hand, right? <laughs> I believe there are 15. Vladimir's nodding? Okay, good. Doing math in front of you, always not a good idea, but that one I have memorized. There are 15. How many parameters in my model are trying to recreate those 15 covariances? There's 18 parameters, but they're not all trying to recreate covariance. So like if I look at this right here, there's a, there's a clue. Variance of the factor is 1. It's loadings. That's the job of the loadings. That's what they're for. And so we would either have one estimated factor variance in five loadings, or no estimated factor variance in six loadings. Works out to be the same number. So that's where we have room to be wrong, because our model is, what's it, what's it called when we have more data than we have parameters we're trying to estimate? Vocabulary word? Over, over determined or over identified, yes. What's it called when we're, we break even? Just. Just, and if we are in the hole, under. under, yeah, so it's opposite of how you would think of it in banking. Like if you are, if you have no money in your bank account and you bounce a check, that's over draft, right? But it should be under. So yes, we are over identified, which means we have room to be wrong. And where that room comes from is the mismatch between the 15 covariances and the six loadings that are trying to recreate them. That's where we, we have room. We don't really have room to be wrong with respect to the item means because we have each item getting its own intercept to become the right answer. We don't have room to be wrong with the variances because each item gets an error variance. So it will just fill in whatever part is not the factor to get back up to the total. So it's all about loadings and covariances. That's the story. Okay, how are we doing? Standardized. So in the standardized solution, 
The scale is then all items have zero means, all items total variances are one, all factor variances are one. So then these slopes become what? And feel free to read from the screen. The answer is usually up there. My, my unstandardized regression slopes turn into what in the standardized solution? Correlations. Correlations, yep. So this is literally how correlated the item response is with the latent trait. And these are not like unique correlations because each of these is being predicted by only one factor. So it really is just a straight bivariate relationship. So now, which item is relatively best? Three. Yeah, three, but by a, a larger margin than it was in the unstandardized solution. So they were nearly equal. One, one and three were nearly equal as the best items in this. And now they're more discrepant. So just reinforcing the idea that standardization is necessary before making relative comparisons. Um, these are effect sizes. So this is what you would look at to try to get a sense as to whether your factor is behaving like you intended. Which items are relatively best is kind of like a form of, it's, it's heading towards the direction of validity, right? Heading towards that direction. Um, internal scale structure, I think, is one of the validity standards that are, are in the most recent edition of that, the big manual of all this stuff about testing. I don't remember what it's called. but So right now it looks like 1, 3 are relatively best, followed by 5. So what do they have in common? 1, 3, and 5. They're yeah, they're the reverse coded ones. So am I measuring forgiveness, or am I measuring not unforgiveness? Right, this is like, this is the ambiguity of direction here. I'm measuring, most of the loadings are contributing on towards the reverse items, I'm measuring the opposite of forgiveness, whatever that is. Okay, and R square is the only other thing that might be relevant to look at on this page, but you only need one or the other. Because R squared is R squared. So you can look at either metric. All right, and then same idea. I have standardized loadings that recreate the correlations in the data, whereas unstandardized loadings recreate covariances. And in both cases, the model is saying that items one and two are, should be more related, or saying it's more related than they actually are. The correlation in the data between these two items is 0.24. The model says it should be 0.36, so we're off a little bit. The question is, how far off are we on the rest of the correlations? And that will help us determine whether or not we have evidence that this model works for these data. Okay, I think that's where we left off last time, right? You want to talk about Levon? You will be able to use Levon for any analyses that you're doing on your own data, and you can use it for some of the parts of the homework. But there are going to be places where the answers differ enough that they will be counted as incorrect if you get them from Levon, unfortunately. That's the reality. So um, I'm assuming that folks who are interested in learning Levon are used to working in R already. Is that a fair assumption? If you want to do it this way. Otherwise, you're like, I don't want to do R. Are you going to make me? No, I'm not going to make you. You can just completely <clears throat> ignore this if that's the case. But the way that it works is that you have to define your model syntax as an object and then feed that into the Levon function. So that's why we have this one giant thing that starts with a quote here and ends in a quote. Like I am creating a new thing that this text is to be saved to. And there are some conventions in here that are unfortunate. Let's put it that way. So I need, to, I need to zoom in because of all the special characters. So sit is the name of my factor. Equal squiggle is the analog to buy. I believe that's a tilde. Judge's ruling on that. It's the thing above the tab on the left-hand side of your keyboard. And then we list the items separated by plus signs. This is not correct in terms of what it means, but this is how the code works. So we're not adding the items together. These are outcomes being predicted by this latent variable. So this is unnecessarily confusing. 
Intercepts are listed next, and the way that we refer to those in the code is squiggle and a 1. So that means estimate it, don't fix it to 1. The error variances, variances of any kind, I should say, are two squiggles, followed by what do you want it to be. So this is a covariance with itself, otherwise known as a variance. So if you wanted to have covariances, like if you wanted 1 and 3 to be covariate, you'd switch that out like that. So covariance and variance are done the same way with that, that logic as covariance is something with itself as its variance. Then last but not least, sit squiggle 0 is how you tell it, make the factor mean 0. And sit squiggle squiggle 1 with a star means fixed. So the stars mean opposite. In M plus, they mean free. In Levon, they mean fixed. I'm sorry. I'm just the messenger here. I don't know why these decisions were made. It was not my pay grade. Like in M plus, there's a lot of defaults. That means you can get by with a lot less co coding, but this is the most complete representation of what's on and off in terms of models parameters being estimated. And I have, these are comments, by the way, but everything is green because that's what it looks like when you load it up unless you change the default settings of how your RStudio operates. So that's why it looks like all bunch of comments, but it's not. So then we feed it into Levon, and I always name my arguments so that you'll know what you're asking for. So the first thing it wants is what the syntax object is that you made, the data. We're going to use the same estimator as in plus. This mimic option, I think, also controls what defaults are activated. There's mimic equals a couple different uh, other alternative SEM packages. And then there's also this, which is the shorter way to make sure your factors are standardized. So you can say standardize dot latent variable equals true, and then you don't have to actually say make the factor variance one, make the factor mean zero. And then asking for all the same output I would get out of M plus, fit, R square, standardized solution, and such. So within Levon, there are multiple different functions that fit specific versions of structural equation models. CFA is one, SEM is one. I think there's growth, maybe, for growth models. Does that sound right? Anybody? You play with that? Yeah. So here's the shorter version where all you would really have to write is what items go with your factor and then everything else is estimated by default. If you're telling it you have standardized latent variables, it fits, puts those constraints in here for you. So this is much shorter version. This is the longer complete version. One thing that it does in its output that I really like is that it appends the standardized results. So you don't have two separate sets of results. They're all in one nice place. So these are your factor loadings and they converge to the same answers that M plus gave in this case. They have intercepts as a category here, although they have dots versus not dots. And dots means it's actually an intercept, it's being predicted, and not dot means it's actually a mean, it's unpredicted. So M plus separates those into means versus intercepts as the labels, Levon does not. Likewise, variances. Ones with dots are error variances of things that are being predicted. Ones without dots are just variances of the variable. And so it's including the variance of the factor in here. And note that things that are fixed do not have standard errors or test statistics. That's the analog to the 999 that M plus does. It just leaves it blank. And the fully standardized solution, standardized all, is the analog to STPYX. So that's the one that we want to pay attention to. This one is standardized with respect to the latent variable only. Okay, there. So, how are we doing so far? So the code is not too bad, I don't think. I mean, it's, it's relatively transparent. Certainly easier than, you know, all the linear combination stuff that we're doing in the other class. Am I right? <laughs> Questions, Zach, hit me. Um, could you please repeat uh, uh, what that, that little line of code, code was where you had the squiggle and the one, the one uh, for, for all of the different uh, variables? Uh, uh, item, item intercepts, intercepts. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the one means that it's estimated, not that it's fixed to one. So what this is actually referring to is the stupid triangle thing, like like the triangle is predicting it. But it looks confusing because otherwise you would think that you're fixing it to one. It's not, it's not what it means. Fixing it is when you use a star with a one instead. But a star means free in M plus. So keeping that straight is a little bit tricky. Otherwise, yeah, I think that's, so like this sit squiggle zero, that's saying take that mean and don't estimate it, make it zero instead. All right, so we don't know yet. Any other questions, I should say? Beg everybody. All right. We don't know yet if this model's any good. We haven't talked about how to evaluate that yet. That's, that's coming. That's like the next thing. But I want to demonstrate what happens when you change your method of identification. So this model is in the key of Z with respect to the factor, standardized factor. Here is an alternative. So I'm calling this model 2 on page 6. This is an equivalent model identified differently. This is the default. And I have done y'all a solid and highlighted the parts that changed. <laughs> so what's in yellow here then? In this method of scaling, I have designated item 1 as the marker or the anchor item. Sometimes they call it that. And its loading has been fixed to 1. That happens by default. I'm making it explicit. So the rest of these now are being estimated. The middle two lines are exactly the same because I'm still keeping the factor mean identified at zero. So that means I can estimate all six intercepts. I always have all six variances. That doesn't change as a function of identification. And I'm now estimating the factor variance instead. So this model is halfway in the key of Z and halfway in the key of item 1. With respect to the factor variance, it's in the key of item 1. With respect to the factor mean, it's still on the z-score metric. This is how you would want to do it if your factor is eventually going to be predicted by other things in your model. Because you want to have its variance be able to change as you add predictions to it and it would shrink, it needs to be able to adapt to the model. So having that be an estimated quantity ensures that that can happen. Changes then in Levon, we have a one with the star in front of the loading, that means fix it to one. And then sit, squiggle, squiggle, sit, means give me the covariance of the situation latent factor with itself. So turning that variance on. The short version of the syntax would only need to say that we have that loading. And then standardized latent variable switches to false because it's no longer standardized. So, new results. Situation 1 item loading fixed to 1. That's why we don't have test statistics. The same conclusions, though, with respect to relatively how these items compare to each other would be found in this solution than in that one. So previously, the first loading was 1.2. The second loading was 0.7. So the second item looks like it's a little bit worse. Now, the first loading is 1, the second loading is 0.5. So the, the relative shifts have been maintained. We're just starting from a different anchor point as to what 1 means. 1 is not the standard deviation of the factor score anymore. What is going to be, though, 1.523. That's my new factor variance. That comes from the amount of item 1's variance that is due to the factor. So in the previous solution, when we had fixed the factor variance to 1, its loading squared times the factor variance created that number. 
So 1.523 is the amount of item 1's variance that is due to the factor. That is now the factor's variance after we change it so that the model is identified by fixing that loading to 1. So now what's a standard deviation? Someone please get their calculator out, or unless you're a savant. What's the square root of 1.523? I bet it's 1.234, because that was what the loading was that I squared to get that number. See how I did that? Didn't do math in front of you, I did memory in front of you. But that's where it comes from. So, a standard deviation of 1.234 makes it a little bit trickier to interpret the solution. That's all. So, you just have, then what a one unit change means is different. That's all. Um, the amount of the variance that is left over is exactly the same. That hasn't changed at all. Likewise, because we kept the factor mean fixed to zero, these item intercepts are exactly the same. So the only things that changed was that set of loadings and then the corresponding factor variance. What if I had decided I wanted to make item six the anchor, the marker? Could I do that? Is my model going to fit any better? No. I could. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing because I know that it's related. So any item that is related can be the marker item. There really is not a reason to pick one over the other. But then if this were one, that would mean that all these other loadings get a lot bigger by comparison. One more, I'm highlighting what's going to happen in the next version of this model, changing the method of identification again. 4.547 is the next number we need to keep a hold of. Questions, is there any rule on what factor gets fixed to one or any factor is okay? Um, if you mean any item, then any is okay so long as it actually relates to the factor. If the true loading were zero, then it wouldn't have any information to push up to the factor to become its variance. So that would break it. But otherwise, no, it doesn't matter. Once we get into um, invariance testing, that will be something we, we pay more attention to, though, because we want to make sure we're not putting invariance constraints with the identification constraints. But that, we're not there yet. So mean of item 1, 4.547. Hang on to that. If I change my method of identification one more time for demonstration purposes here, model three, I'm keeping it so that the marker item is item one with the loading of one. That means the factor variance is estimated, but now I'm switching out the identification for the factor mean. And I'm estimating the factor mean and fixing the intercept for item one to zero instead. That's the other choice. So now this entire factor is scaled in the key of item one both with respect to its mean and with respect to its variance. In the Levon code, I shut off the intercept by going squiggle zero, and then I turn on the mean by saying squiggle one. So zeros and ones are like light switches here. They're not really numbers. That's the way to think about it. And so then the part of the solution that changes I have down here, the mean of the situation factor is now 4.547 because that's item 1's mean. Item 1's intercept is 0. That's because, what's an intercept again? What's an intercept? Expected outcome when the predictors are 0, right? So this expected outcome to item 1 is 0 when the factor is 0, but the factor now has a mean of 4.5. So that's why this is way off, because the reference point for the model is a factor score that would be like, I don't know, four standard deviations below the mean or something. All right. Why did I, why did I highlight this one? I don't know why. 
Just got a little highlight happy, I think. I highlighted that one because that's where the mean of uh, situations is. Okay. So that's the model. How do I know if it's any good? We don't know that yet. We know that all of the loadings are significant. We know that all of them are reasonably sized. They all look like they're contributing. But we don't know if this model fits. We don't know if it's consistent with a one-factor structure. The logic by how we're going to do that is two, in two points of comparison. How does our model look relative to the best possible model you can have? And how does it look relative to the worst possible model you can have? Those are going to be the new benchmarks. But we have to introduce a whole lot of vocabulary to do that. OK, switching gears. I'm in lecture 4B. I'm going to skip estimation for right now. Because if Jonathan comes to teach for me next week because I'm in jury duty, I'm letting him do that part. <laughs> He's much better at it. So. But I will, I will show you my joke, though. Like, you know the expression black box to describe something where you're not sure how it works on the inside? When you run M+, literally a black DOS window pops up, and then the answers come back. So it's the, it's the instantiation of the black box in real life. So that's, that's how it works. There you go. OK, so I'm skipping ahead here into slide 16. The big picture of model fit. So as a reminder, what all we're trying to estimate and for what reason. So we are trying to recapture, recreate the means of these items, and we will do that by giving each item its own intercept and potentially a factor mean if we identify the model so that that's being estimated instead of one of the intercepts. So as long as there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, this should be fine. You will get your means back. That's not usually a constraint you would put on the model. Only in growth models, where you're trying to look at change over time, would you try to do anything with respect to constraining the intercepts. Likewise, the variance of the original items is going to be accurately recaptured by the model so long as each item gets its own unique error variance. It will just plug in whatever hole of variance is there after controlling for the factor. So here's the formula by which the variances are recreated. It's the loading of that item squared times the variance of the factor. That's factor part. And then E variance just plugs in for whatever is left. These also not often constrained. The big thing we're paying attention to is the match between covariances and loadings. We have more covariances than we have loadings. That means we have room to be wrong. That's where the primary source of misfit comes in, misprediction. So here are the two endpoints that we are going to use as a reference to decide how much evidence is consistent with our, how, how, our, how consistent our model is with the data. So independence or null model is one baseline. And in the context of measurement models, this would be the least complex model you would have. In the null model, each item gets its own variance. Each item gets its own intercept, but there are no covariances whatsoever. The alternative is what's called the saturated model. Um, those of you who had longitudinal with me know this as the unstructured matrix. It's the same idea. It's a different word. It will be labeled as H1. And this is where, hey, can I just, can you just directly estimate all my means, variances, and covariances? And then we see how tall it makes the data. Our model is somewhere in the middle, and it will be called HO. When I first started looking at these outputs, I had a hard time remembering which one was HO and which one was H1. And then I had an experience happen to me that forever made me remember. I was in office hours at the University of Nebraska, and I, I used to hold them in a computer lab, so everyone would come and do their homework and hang out and ask questions. And I was trying to help someone from the longitudinal class. And someone from the SEM class looked up at me. Her name is Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. And she said, am I the hoe? Uh, what? 
What? You know, in M plus. H-O, am I the hoe? Yes. Yes, Lindsay, you're the hoe. Yes. Okay, thanks. And normally would not say that to a student, but she's the hoe. And after that, I never forgot. And I have a gag to show you, too. Is that right? Oh, it is. Okay, Zoomers, I'll hold this up to my camera. I had to do a pickup at Kohl's, and they print the first two letters of your last name on your pickup order. So I am the hoe. Like, legit. I got my own sign and everything. So, so write that down. You all are the hoe when you're looking at these things. H1 is how tall the perfect model is. So the, in model estimation, the end goal is to find the model parameters that maximize the height of the data, and we're using the multivariate normal distribution as our formula for height in this case. That's the short version of estimation. So this number right here represents the best possible fit for our data. And we can compare our number and see how much worse it is. This is a different idea than usual. We're trying to make our model less worse than perfect. So the point of comparison is parsimony. You get a likelihood ratio test on your output that is labeled as the chi-square test of model fit here. This is a model comparison between the HO and the H1. It's computed a little bit different way, though, because of the scaling factors that show up with the robust estimation. So the formula is different. These are indices of how far off from perfect you are uh, in terms of multivariate normality. So this is our primary test of whether our model fits, whether it is not worse than the best possible alternative. We also get a piece of useless information on our output, the comparison of our model versus the null of the, yeah, null model versus saturated, not even ours. So that is answering the question, are there any correlations worth modeling at all? Because if this model that has all the covariances in it doesn't fit better than this one, it means you have no covariance and it's game over. So you can ignore this because it doesn't help us. It doesn't refer to our model, but we will look at this one here. And this output is indeed from the analyses we just finished. So 308 with nine degrees of freedom and a p-value that is zero to four decimal places. Now, normally, do we want p-values to be significant? Normally. normally, yes. Okay, do we want this one to be significant? No. We do not. Significant means significantly worse than perfect. That's what it means. There is a difference between models. Ours is not good enough. In Levon, we get the same information rearranged in terms of how it's presented and labeled. So I get something called minimum function test statistic. That's your chi-square test. It prints out the regular version and the robust version. We're going to pay attention to robust most of the time here. Model test baseline model is the null versus saturated comparison. And then we have a bunch of other fit indices that will be forthcoming. These are the log likelihoods by which you can do model comparisons. So in your homework, using the online homework system, the first thing I'm going to ask you about any model is the HO log likelihood right here. Because if you have that right, you have the model right in terms of what it contains and how, and how many parameters it is. So that'll be like the check, like a fingerprint essentially for your analyses. Each log likelihood goes with one model. All right, so in our model, we have nine degrees of freedom. Do you know how we got there? Let's count them up. What's the total possible? How many means are across my six items? Six, six. yeah, don't, don't think too hard. How many variances across my six items? Six. six. Okay, I'm up to 12. How many covariances? 15. 15. What is that added together? 27. <laughs> there we go. That's, that's the total. Now let's start taking away. 
How many intercepts did we estimate? Six. Six. How many variances did we estimate? Six. Six. How many loadings? Six. That's where it is. It's 15 covariances versus six loadings. That's where your nine degrees of freedom come from. So we could add nine more things before we break even our, and are just identified. But because we have degrees of freedom left over that's positive, we have room to be wrong. Our model is testable. What do you think these would look like if we only had three items? If I have three items, how many parameters going in? Three means, three variances, three covariances? And how many parameters would come back out in a standard congeneric model here? Three intercepts, three error variances, three loadings. Nine in, nine out, degrees of freedom are zero. So what do you think the chi-square value here would be? Remember, this is a comparison between best possible and yours. Zero. It would be zero, because that's what just identified means. There is no room to be wrong. You re perfectly recreated it because you spent all the possible parameters. So model fit looks perfect when it's not testable. So then, lots of different indices get built out of these two premises. How much worse is it than perfect? How much better is it than the worst possible model? So four steps in assessing model fit and the viability of our solution. Global fit is first. Does the model work as a whole? Does it adequately overall create, recreate the means, variances, and covariances of your items? And there are conventions that have become dogmatic in how they're applied that modern research has suggested do not necessarily work all the time. So I have a little bit about that in this slide deck as well. Next step is local fit. Looking at the very specific elements of the prediction to see if there's any places where your model doesn't work, but it looks okay on the whole if you average out everything. Then the parameters themselves, are they plausible? Do they make sense? Um, M plus will be perfectly happy to give you a negative variance, for instance. Does that make any sense? It does not, but that was the number it decided on to make the data the tallest. So we have to check the solution to make sure that all the estimates are within the bounds that they're supposed to be. And then the last step is looking at reliability. Once you have a factor structure that is adequately fitting, then we can talk about how well the trait's being measured, but not until then. So first step then, our primary index of model fit is this chi-square. There's another way to compute it based on um, a, a fitting function in complete data, but the way I would think about it is it's a likelihood ratio test between the perfect model, H1, and your model, which is H what? Ho. Yeah, you're never going to forget this now. You are the ho. H-O. So this is testing the null hypothesis that the model predicted variance, covariance matrix, and mean vector is equal to the model estimated one, which is denoted as, as S, the, in the data in the sample. So significance is bad. Um, you'll see some people try to use rules like this to justify a significant result and pretend like it's not there. Don't do that. Those don't work. Um, Chi-square is sensitive to sample size. So that means that if you have a very large sample, you have a ton of power. Now, normally, that's a good thing, right? But in this context, it means that your model can be significantly worse even when it's pretty damn accurate because you have a lot of power to detect those discrepancies. So for that reason, people have developed other indices. And what happens in practice is that the chi-square is always significant, and we look at the other indices primarily. So the two other families of indices that will show up on your output, absolute or comparative. Absolute indices are how much worse than perfect you are. Comparative is how much better than crappy you are, the null model, the worst possible model. So one, the first one here is a, is a absolute kind, standardized root mean square residual. Here's a pro tip. If the name of the fit index has the word error or residual in it, you want it to be small. It does. That's how it works. 
Uh, I have the formula here. I can say it in words faster. This is how far off your correlations are on average. That's what it tells you. 0.08 or less is the conventional standard people say that's close enough. And that's in a correlation metric. The unstandardized version is sometimes also provided, but is less inter interp interpretable. So that's one we'll look at. A big one, very uh, one that you should report for sure, RMSEA, root mean square error of approximation. Again, this is one we want to have little. This is how far off you are for each spot in your each predicted element, weighted by degrees of freedom. So. You, if you add parameters to try and improve your fit, you can actually make this one worse. It's a parsimony corrected issue. And there are a lot of creative labels for what we would call the values of this. I just give it a, I just give it a number. I don't try to label it. Like my RMSEA is 0.07. You call that what, what you want. One thing that makes this one different, though, is that you can get a confidence interval for it. And also printed with the confidence interval is another type of significance test, and it is called close fit. Not exact fit, but close fit. So that is testing whether or not your RMSEA is less than or equal to 0.05 as, a, as an alternative. So it's a little bit like, okay, it's not going to be perfect, but is it good enough kind of idea. The other ones, relative to the worst possible model then, CFI and TLI, um, this one has a couple different names. They get at the same idea. How much better is your model than the null model that has no relationships whatsoever? And the TLI one is unstandardized, so it does go above one. CFI is standardized so that it stays within the boundaries of zero and one. So it is the case that these will disagree. Let's take a look at what our happy little model has. So back to the handout, starting on page 8. Here's all the stuff we get. So 27 possible degrees of freedom. We spent 18. Six items times three parameters each leaves us nine left over but the nine come from the covariances versus the loadings specifically. So the first thing M plus tells you is how many parameters are in your model. How many are free means how many are estimated. So I, this is a good place to stop to make sure that it's following your code because you should be able to anticipate what that number is. Then we get log likelihood values for your model with the scaling correction factor. Um, and I think I put this on your reading list for later in this unit in Craig Ender's Missing Data Book, of all things. Chapter 5 is the best description of what this number means that I've seen. It, it's some kind of ratio of first to second derivatives that should hold to be 1 if the data are perfectly multivariate normal. And to the extent that that ratio deviates from 1, that is then used to adjust all the standard errors and the chi-square tests of fit. So he has the math in there. I would recommend that chapter if you want to read more about it. So we have then perfect model versus our model. And these are in log likelihoods, which means bigger is better. So this value is as good as it possibly gets. AIC and BIC. And if you're like, hey, are those the same thing they were in multi-level? Yeah, it's the same. Here's the formula for each of these things. These are functions of log likelihood times minus 2, so they're scaled in such that smaller is better. So it's opposite. These are used for non-nested model comparisons predominantly. And then here's the big one, our chi-square test. This is a likelihood ratio test using the scaling factors to compare our model, HO, against perfect model and significance is bad. It warns you down here that if you use any of these estimators, you can't just take the straight difference in minus two log likelihood. So here is where the math works out. So you start with the difference in minus two log likelihood, as usual, and then you correct for the number of parameters and the scaling factors in the formula here. So I built you a spreadsheet that does this. 
and ANOVA in R will do this for you if you use Livon. So it's a little bit ugly formula, but not too bad. So then it matches what it spit out to at least rounding error. So RMSEA value for this model, 0.173. What do you think about that? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down. This is RMSEA error. We want it to be zero as best case scenario. So this is not conventionally good enough. And this p-value being significant here means that no, it is not less than 0.05, for sure. The interval here is going to reflect your sample size. So if you have smaller samples, this interval will be wider. It's less certain what it should be. Next up, CFI-TLI, 0.7 and 0.5. What do we think of these? Also very bad. What's the best they can be? For CFI, it's 1. TLI can actually go above 1. Standardized root mean square residual, 0.086. What do we think of that? Yeah, very close. So if you're looking at this and going, wait, so one of these might say it's good enough and another might not? Yes. Happens all the freaking time. And part of that is because they're different standards for what good enough is. I personally like the null model as like a metaphor for life. Because each of us sometimes feels insecure about what we know, what we can do. And if we compare ourselves to people who know and do more, then we're going to feel like shit, right? But if you compare yourself to like you two years ago, and how much more you know and can do, like if you compare yourself to the null model version of you, then you can feel good about all the progress you've made. So CFI and TLI are like, how much better are you than the worst possible model you can have? Where all the way better is one, right? Versus RMSEA is how much worse are you than perfect? That's like the perfectionist version, where this is worse. Perfect is zero. So yeah, they're different standards. And they disagree. Well, people, and you just noted that publishing So the, the question was, when people publish, should they just pick the number they're happiest with and report that? Yes. Don't do that, though. I would give all the numbers. Um, if you wanted to sort of be most complete, you would say model fit was acceptable by this index, this index, and this index, but not by this one, this one, and this one. Like, I, you might phrase it into a binary dis discussion like that. But the conventional cutoffs don't necessarily apply to every case. We'll talk about that, too. Um, in this case, these are so far away that, e like, I'm not going to trust this one is the outlier. Like, these are all indicating this is not good. And here is the math for where this one came from. So this is null versus perfect. Has nothing to do with your model. So it will be the same value no matter what, and you can ignore it. So the 15 degrees of freedom in this comparison are the 15 covariances in the data because the null model has none and the perfect model has all of them. Here is what that same output looks like in R. Nope, not that one. So there are two columns. The first column is using standard maximum likelihood estimation without the robustness correction for non-normality. And it's nice that they give you both because you can see how your conclusions might change but if your data are perfectly normal, this scaling factor goes to 1, and all the rest of the parts of the formula cancel out. So it, def like it simplifies to ML. So the worst it can be is overkill. It's not going to hurt to use it. This value, the scaling factor value, is not given by other programs, and so then you would not be able to do model comparisons correctly unless you had it, though, in the robust land. So the first thing it tells you then this test statistic thing right here. That's, that's our chi-square test of the two. We can ignore that one. Then we get into the fit indices, all the ones that M plus has plus a little bit extra. So there's robust versions of CFI and TLI, and I honestly don't know what those are. Because it's already robust here, it might be robust to something else. Does anybody know? Any heard of these before? No, I don't know. So, hey internet, 
If anyone knows, please tell me. Here are the log likelihood values. So note, these two numbers are the same. That's not a coincidence. What robust does does not change the parameters. It changes the inferences about the parameters. It changes the test statistics, and it changes the standard errors. And AIC and DIC, also the same, for the same reason. Uh, RMSCA in, so this is somewhat interesting. If we use standard ML, it's 0 0.205, and ours is smaller. So part of what looks like misfit could actually be assumptions that are not holding. And we have another type of confidence interval. So this is not an M plus either. How are we doing? Slight nods. We're not doing, are we? Yeah. So it may be helpful. So many comparisons. Yeah, I know. I know. It, it may be helpful to see like what the upper limit is for your data in terms of how bad it can be and how good it can be. So I wanted to show you what the code would look like to actually fit these models. So the saturated model, the perfect model, is when you literally just ask all the means, variances, and covariances to be spit back at you. So in M+, plus, those are the six item means. These are the six item variances. And here's a trick, by the way. If you stack up all six, the word with means covaried with. And then the six on the other side, that gives you all possible combinations. So it's less typing. You don't have to type out all 15. Same thing, um, actually, I couldn't figure out how to do that in Levon, so I was like, screw it, I'll just write it out. But there's probably a way. So this is the saturated model. So note number of free parameters is 27. We spent them all. HO and H1 log likelihoods are exactly the same because our model is now the perfect model. And look, it fits perfectly. So the chi-square is indeed zero. This model is just identified. And here is the matrix it gave me. So in the output, you would get this. This is from R. M plus lists it as a, uh, this is a list of results. It's harder to format. Here is the empty model, null model, excuse me, wrong class. Same, same concept, though. In multi-level, we start with the empty model as the worst possible model. The analog to that is the null model here. So in this model, we have all the means and all the variances, but all the covariances are shut off. So do you see how each of these is at zero? That's how you fix it to be not estimated. And then... In R, that apparently is a default. You don't have to actually write that. So then now, our model says these items have nothing in common at all. That's what prediction is. So I only spent 12 parameters because I have six means and six variances. My chi-square is wildly significant, as you might predict. RMSEA is 0.26, so that's like an upper bound on how bad it can be. The worst possible model has an RMSEA of 0.26. Ours had an RMSEA of like 0.17. So pretty bad. CFI and TLI are exactly zero because they are comparisons of our current model against the null model. Our current model is the null model, so they're exactly the same. And the worst possible SRMR we could have for these data is 0.3. So our correlations are off on average by 0.3. So how do I fix it? My model sucks. Is that the end? Take my ball and go home? Sorry, NIH, I know you gave me $3 million to develop this new scale, but it didn't fit, so I'm done. That's never going to be a satisfactory answer. 
but you got to know how to fix it to make it better. So let me give you a real world example. Report cards. My kid doesn't have report cards yet, but he will someday. And if he comes home with, say, a 3.0 GPA, what do I think about that? That's a B average, right? I, if he's doing his best, then I'll be happy with that. But is it four Bs or is it three A's and an F? Because how to help him do better would be a very different strategy in each of those cases. So overall, the report card GPA is like global fit. Like it's like summarizing across the entire matrix. But if global fit isn't good enough, and even when it is, we would still want to make sure that each little piece is adequately recreated. So we have to dig into the details of which correlations are the most off to then try to figure out what to do about it. That's local fit. So this is where the term residual gets used, and that is not a synonym for error of the items. It sounds like it should be, but it's not. Residual means discrepancy, offness. So the way that we, we shall fix this is to compare the data from the, COVID, the saturated model. This is the right answer, okay? That's the best possible model. This is the prediction created by our model. So the variances are loading squared times variance of the factor plus error variance. Those will be okay. Covariances are loading times variance of the factor times the loading for the other item that it's covarying with. That's how we get these predictions. The means are intercept plus the loading times the factor mean. So those are going to match. So the output we want is literally the difference of this matrix minus that one. Or the other way around, actually. Yeah. What it is minus what it's supposed to be. And so we get this discrepancy or residual matrix. And this helps us figure out how we're off. So the negative values mean that the items are less related than what the data say. And the positive values means the items are more related than what the data say. Positive ones are easier to fix because we just have to add something that lets them be more related. So if we look at the patterns, the negative ones are the ones in the opposite direction. The model thinks they should be more related than they are. The ones that are worded the same, like there's a couple big ones, the model isn't properly accounting for all of their relationship. They're more related than what the model says. So it definitely looks like this wording thing is the problem. Note how far off the variances are. They're perfect. That's because each item has an error variance to become whatever it needs to be. Likewise, the discrepancies in the means, they're perfect too. So it really is the covariances that we're focusing on. Discrepancies in correlation are a little bit easier to track because these are standardized. So this is what it looks like in R, and this is what it looks like in M+. Plus. And I've highlighted the ones that are the biggest. So that will be what we, somebody, maybe me, starts with next week. How's that sound? When do you find out? Monday night. So that's what I was going to tell you all. I watch for an email from me Monday night with the plan. If Jonathan's teaching for me, he will have his own Zoom room, and I'll send out the link for that. Um, I'm hoping I don't have to go, but who knows. So. 
I will uh, give him his marching orders as to what he gets to talk about. He's going to talk about estimation and local fit, it looks like. But he likes to talk about that stuff, unlike me. <laughs> All right, questions? All right, a lot of new vocabulary. We'll keep working on it throughout the semester. Thanks for being here. Have good weekends. Yeah, it's Thursday. Let me know if you need anything and work on your homework one. Bye, folks. Question, Zach. Um, can I ask a question that's specific to my uh, homework one?